Krishna-prasthaya-bhūtale-śrī-caitanya-mano-bhīstam-stāpitam-yena-bhūtale-śvāyam-rūpa-kadam-mayam-dadāti-svāpadāntikam-namā-om-viṣṇu-pādāya-
prachar karena kehana karena achar. Some behave well, very well, but do not preach the cult of Krishna consciousness. Whereas others preach, but do not behave properly. Archa prachar namea prahaha dui karya tumi sarva guru tumi jagatera arya. But you simultaneously perform both activities in relationship to the holy name by your personal behavior and by your preaching. Therefore, you are the most advanced devotee of the Lord. So that's Sanatana Goswami glorifying Srila Haridas Thakur. Personally, he spoke that to him. Mm -hmm. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, also spoke something which is the fundamental principle of Vaishnava etiquette, which makes up three verses from the Chaitanya Charitamrita Antyalila, verses 128 through 130, where he says, Tapani Bhakata Svabhava Maryada Raksana Maryada Palanahaya Sadura Bhushana. My dear Sanatan, although you are the deliverer of the entire universe, and although even the demigods and great saints are purified by touching you, it is the characteristic of a devotee to observe and protect the Vaishnava etiquette. Maintenance, maintenance of the Vaishnava etiquette is the ornament of a devotee. Hmm. So we might use an example. When a person is dressed very nicely, Sometimes we see there is always one outstanding part of that dress which is noticeable immediately. Such as sometimes we see uh, a person maybe dressed in a tuxedo and they have a big flower hanging from their lapel. <laughs> and so the flower becomes very easily noticeable. Or what we say, obviously noticeable. Or sometimes a lady, <laughs> she'll be dressed very nicely, but she'll have a beautiful, beautiful, uh, what we say, necklace on. So that stands out amongst her beautiful dress. So Vaishnava etiquette is considered to be an ornament on the body of the devotee. Hmm. The one who maintains and protects, and one who maintains the Vaishnava etiquette is actually practicing the spiritual principles to the utmost. <laughs> Therefore, behavior is very important. And so there are many principles. According to one's level of spiritual practice, one will exhibit a certain level of behavior. Just like it says, according to one's level of riches, one will dress accordingly. So if one is very wealthy, they will display that wealth in the, in the way they live, by what they have, how they dress, like that, how, what is their house? If they're poor, they'll also they dispose, display their poverty according to their level of, of finances. So in the same way, a devotee's etiquette will also develop as they make advancement in spiritual life. As we mentioned, it says here, etiquette is the ornament of a Vaishnava. But what does this mean? Okay. So a true Vaishnava, therefore, adorns himself with all the characteristics like that. So um, this is a very uh, detailed, broad, and complex subject because in all aspects of Krishna consciousness, there is, a, there is a standard of etiquette that works according to the level of practice and according to the uh, uh, activity that is being performed. So there's etiquette in day-to-day -day dealings with each other. There's de etiquette with the deities. There's etiquette staying in the temple room. There's etiquette in kirtan. There's etiquette in prashadam. There's etiquette... Uh, in, in in cooking in the kitchen. There's etiquette on all different levels. So these things have to be understood and observed because it's the basis for the practice of Krishna consciousness. As they say, uh, 
example is higher than precept. Precept means philosophical principle. Example means how you, how you behave like that. Or how you interact with others. So there's one verse which kind of illustrates a little bit about um, some of the fundamental principles of Vaishnav interaction. Let me see if I can find it here. It's actually a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's actually from the fourth canto, eighth chapter, verse number 34. And this is spoken to Dhruva Maharaj. When Dhruva Maharaj was performing his austerities, trying to, you know, attract the attention of the Supreme Personality of Godhead by his austerities, he... Uh, he was performing these very difficult austerities as a young boy. So Narada Muni came and he came to test him. It appears he came to discourage him, but he was his, in his way of discouraging it was a kind of a test just to see, the, just to increase the determination of Dhruva Maharaj. Sometimes we find that that is a way of increasing we find a person, when they're put under pressure, they excel. <laughs> Some people, when they put under pressure, they go back, they recede. Others like pressure because pressure, generally, as a principle, brings out the good qualities of a person in any form, just like you see. Well, I have personal examples like people in prison, especially devotees in prison, they, their devotional service really takes off when they're in prison. <laughs> I mean, devotees who were devotees before they entered the prison, and then when they got into that environment, they focused all their attention and, and energy in keeping Krishna conscious amongst a very impossible environment, practically. And because of that, they do wonderful service. Sometimes they write books, preach to their fellow inmates, and their own spiritual practice is nothing like it was when they were out in the so-called free world. They increase more and more. So Narada Muni knows that Dhruva likes pressure. So he tries to discourage him by saying certain things about uh, the principles of Brahminical culture. Now, Br Br Dhruva is a Kshatriya, he's not a Brahmin. Nor is he thinking about becoming a Brahmin. So Narada Muni basically is giving him principles in, of Brahminical life. And Dhruva Maharaj says, that that's very nice, but that's not for me. <laughs> if you can give me Krishna, then otherwise I don't need you. <laughs> Basically, that's what he said <laughs> in so many nice words. <laughs> but this verse is really a powerful verse. <clears throat> and it says, Guna dipkan muda lipsed anukrosam guna damat maitrim samadnab anvitschen natapair abibuyate. Every man should act like this when he meets a person more qualified than himself he should become very pleased. When he meets someone less qualified than himself, he should be compassionate towards him. And when he meets someone equal to himself, he should make friendship with him. And then the verse ends, in this way, one is never affected by the threefold miseries of this material world. Hmm, interesting. Simply by this behavior, according to what we say, levels of devotees, one frees themselves from the sufferings of this material world. And the Acharyas go on to say, by giving a, an added purport to this verse, by saying that this is how you love Krishna. You express your love for Krishna by, uh, what we say, uh, being very pleased and respecting those in a higher position, by making friends and those in the equal position, and being compassionate for those in a lesser position. 
So through that interaction with other devotees in different levels, one is expressing their love for Krishna accordingly. <laughs> Interesting how that connects to Krishna through the interaction of devotees according to the proper etiquette. Prabhupada's purport is interesting. He says, generally when we find someone more qualified than ourselves, we become envious of him. When we find someone less qualified, we deride him. And when we find someone equal, we become very proud of our activities. <laughs> I'll read it again. Someone more qualified, we become unhappy, envious. Someone less qualified, we feel good and kind of put that person down. And someone equal, we want to show how wonderful we are. So we become proud and, and brag about our, our accomplishments or something. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, hmm, these are the causes of material tribulations. No, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. These are the causes of all material tribulations. The great sage Nara therefore advised that a devotee should act perfectly. Instead of being envious of a more qualified person, one should be jolly to receive him. Instead of being oppressive to a less qualified man, one should be compassionate towards him just to raise him to the proper standard. And when one meets an equal, instead of becoming proud of one's own activities before him, one should treat him as a friend. One should also have compassion for the people in general who are suffering due to the forgetfulness of Krishna. These important functions will make one happy within this material world. Hmm. So we see, uh, especially when people have the same activities, or saying we might even use the word occupation. If someone is better at that occupation than we are, or is getting more or what we say, reciprocation, and sometimes we feel unhappy thinking that we should get it and not them, or they should get it and I should get it also. We become unhappy about ourselves, that's called jealousy, or we become envious towards them, and we feel unhappy when they are making advancement and becoming, what we say, recognized by others. And then friendship, we see that in the friendship world, people want to display themselves as being the good friend of another person. So they like to speak about their own accomplishments, show their friends how wonderful of a friend they have, and brag about that in different ways. So this is the, uh, this is the deviation, or what we say the defect, of the equals. When someone is less, we feel good because we feel like we're better off. Just like they say, if you see someone suffering and you're also suffering, you, you feel good because you don't, your suffering is not as bad as theirs. <laughs> they, sometimes they say misery loves company. <laughs> yeah. So you're miserable, but if you're alone and miserable, that's really bad. But if you're miserable with other people, it's not so miserable. <laughs> it's still miserable, but... Not in the same degree. <laughs> so, yeah. But here it mentions that when we meet a, a more qualified person, it's two things we should do. We should serve them and we should also look for opportunities to hear from them. So we hear from a more qualified person and try to serve them if we can. When we meet friends, we share Krishna consciousness together, assist each other in our struggles to become Krishna conscious, and talk about Krishna and become just what we say, friendly. The friends are done with equals. And then of course, when we meet a less qualified person, we think, oh, what can I do to help that person move forward to advance to overcome their well, particular situation they're in? So this is a proper consciousness, and Prabhupada goes on to say, and he mentions it, it mentions in the in the in the verse and in the purport, it's mentioned twice, that if one practices this proper culture in etiquette according to the literal different relationships we have with different levels of people, we will never be influenced by the material sufferings, never. All material sufferings go away. This is interesting, just simply by, by behavior, how we can free ourselves and insulate ourselves from the sufferings of this material world. 
That's not the goal, but actually that is simply a feature of proper behavior. So we can talk about Vaishnava etiquette from different levels. I'll read a few statements by His Divine Grace to give us a little bit of a, a little insight in some of the statements Prabhupada made in relationship to that. Um, I mean, there's different groups, there's different types of statements Prabhupada states, uh, states according to different topics. He says, Prabhupada says to one devotee, you are good for everything, but your attitude to remain good for nothing is very nice. <laughs> Did you get that one? No. You are good for everything, but your attitude to remain good for nothing is very nice. <laughs> Sometimes you say, I'm good for nothing. Prabhupada said, you're not, but still it's a good attitude. <laughs> Vaishnava is always humble and meek, and he is never puffed up, even if he has the highest qualities of the demigods. <laughs> Prabhupada's letter. Our dealings with others must be clear, in other words, straightforward, like that. Okay, and Prabhupada is very strong about devotees quarreling and getting into various types of, what we say, conflicts, which really impinges not only upon the devotees in their practice of Krishna consciousness, but it's a bad example for others. Uh, he says to one devotee, you are right. We must all become ideal in character. Then people will, will become very impressed with such purity. A devotee is faultless. He has no flaws. Yeah. So in other words, you can't find a fault in a devotee. Even if you look for it, that's what a devotee is. There's no faults there. Okay, so these are some statements by Srila Prabhupada, according to different categories. Um, what I can do, dealings among grihastas. I'm so glad to learn that your good wife is also helping you. That is the duty of a faithful companion of life. If the wife is helpful in the spiritual progress of life, she is the best friend and philosopher. So in Krishna consciousness, the wife is never a burden, but she is completely a counterpart. So set the example to your own countrymen how younger generations can live peacefully, husband and wife being engaged in Krishna's service. There are many examples of this type of husband and wife working in, in our different centers for propagating this sublime message. <laughs> so wife is the, they say, you know, the wife is the, is the better half of the husband, the better half of the man. So when there's support from the wife in Krishna consciousness and the man uh, performs his duty towards his wife by giving her the material arrangements necessary to live nicely and at the same time guidance in spiritual practice, then the relationship becomes stable like that. Then you can build on it from there. Okay, there's so many different categories that we can speak about. So what I'm going to do at this point is just, and there's many other verses in relationship to etiquette, and I'll uh, go through those other, especially about um, finding fault with others, but I'm going to going to give you a list of different categories and see which one the devotees would like to hear about. So remember that Vaishnava etiquette permeates everything. It's not like well, we are Vaishnavas when we're with devotees, and then when we're out by ourselves, we're different. 
just like sometimes devotees, you know, they tried different things to find out how Prabhupada acted when he was alone. Some, one time they wanted to see Prabhupada in his room, so they were looking through the keyhole, it was a big keyhole in, one, in the door, and they looked through it to see Prabhupada, and guess what they saw? They saw an eye looking back on the other side. <laughs> Prabhupada knew what they were up to. <laughs> you couldn't. But there was a few times where they, they saw Prabhupada when he was alone in his quarters. And he would be either reading his books or chanting japa. They never saw him sleep, of course. But when he was alone, he would always be doing something in a Krishna conscious way. Um, he was never like one way in public and another way. And the Vaishnava is like that. They carry their etiquette even when they're alone in their behavior in the day-to-day -day activities like that. So, But we don't see that in the, in the uh, secular world where people like to make a particular presentation of themselves to the public and then when they're outside they have a different character a different way of speaking a different way of behaving so that's not Vaishnava because cultivation of character is a constant thing where it's not simply done in circles of Vaishnavas but it's done 24 hours a day if we stop cultivating that character 24 hours a day, then it becomes difficult to build on it when it's required in the day-to-day, -day, what we say, public. Mm. So I'll read a list of uh, categories that we can think about. Um, here's, here's about 10 I'll read, and then we'll see if the, which devo the devotees can... Uh, Raise your hand and see which one we can do first, and we'll go on. Uh, treating women as mothers, Vaishnav Aparad, dressing like a Vaishnav, correcting others, etiquette and management, temple room etiquette, serving guests and life members, serving and honoring Prashad, Kirtan etiquette, etiquette in public, etiquette in holy places, and etiquette with Indian Brahmanas, Mayavadis, and members of other Sampradayas. Mm -hmm. So, we'll take any suggestions and then we can go. Yes? In etiquette in Indian Brahmanas, Mayavadis, and other Sampradayas? Is that the one you want? You want to hear? Seems like it's not as relevant as as. <laughs> oh. Yeah, my body. Well, there is etiquette in public. That's another category we mentioned. There's always an etiquette between different types of people. It doesn't, that doesn't mean you agree with their philosophy. <laughs> yeah, it's not so important, really. Mm -hmm. Serving and honoring Prashadam? Okay. Um, is that okay? We turned right to it. Okay. Okay. Serving and honoring prashadam. Okay. This is very important because I notice when I go to different places, the breach of etiquette 
it becomes quite obvious. Okay, so 40. When a devotee distributes prashad, remnants of food offered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, in order to maintain our spirit of devotional service, we must accept this prashad as the Lord's grace, resume through the pure devotee. So you never refuse Maha Prashadam if someone gives it to you. You may take your own level. In other words, say you decide you don't really feel like accepting any foodstuffs at that moment. Still, you can't refuse Maha, so you have to accept a little. That little can be as little as you want. And therefore, because Krishna is non different than Maha Prashadam. What is the difference between prashadam and maha prashadam? Maha prashadam is the, is the food that's on the plate of the deity. That's maha prashadam. What is offered on the side as part of that same offering is prashadam. But only, only what goes on the plate of the deity is called maha prashadam. Um, prashadam is non different than Krishna. This is sometimes hard for us to really realize. But Krishna is absolute. So when Krishna comes in contact with the offering of foodstuffs that's offered with the right mood, according to the, the right way to offer, then that food becomes transformed into prasad simply by Krishna's touch. Like that. So prasadam is Krishna in what we say transcendental food it's not that's why we say we don't eat prashadam we honor prashadam as we honor the lord we also honor the food that is offered to the lord and given back to us as prashadam because the word prashadam means what mercy so that is krishna's special mercy that he accepts these offerings and then he purifies it with his own transcendental energy and then it becomes what we say a source of spiritual nourishment and a source of spiritual advancement like that. Two, use the right hand to eat and drink. Mm -hmm. Even if you're a lefty, <laughs> I won't ask who's a lefty here, but if you're a lefty, still you have to use the right hand. If you go in public and people who have etiquette, they see that, they will think this person is not trained properly. <laughs> like that. That's, I that's ideal, yeah. Mm-hmm. If it can, if it can be, it should be avoided. But if it can't be avoided, then make sure. And because one thing you must do, and this is also, you must wash your hands before you eat. Sometimes we just we're in kirtan, and then the kirtan's over, and the prasadam comes. We sit down. No, <laughs> you must wash your hands before eating. Otherwise, it is considered to be uh, unclean. Prabhupada commented on that. He did it in a very interesting way. He said, my devotees, they want to know about Raganuga Bhakti, but they don't wash their hands before eating. <laughs> so he made it in a facetious way by criticizing us for... You know, we want to go to higher levels of spiritual understanding, but we don't even follow the basic principles of hygiene. So even if your hands are clean by all by your own observation, you must wash your hands before you take prasadam. And I see those devotees who are advanced, they always do it no matter where they are. Sometimes we don't have an opportunity to go to a, a room where there's a but find, but find some way you can wash your hands through some means of, you know. I carry a squirt gun with me, a little bottle. It's here with me today. See this? This is called the sannyas loda for Kali Yuga. 
They go like, you know, so we do this. And this is just water. That's all it is. It's nothing special. And then we can wash our hands and then wipe it. This is what this is for, this sannyas thing they give you on the outside. It's for wiping your hands. Those of you who didn't know that. <laughs> so, yeah, this is, very, this is very essential to, you know, make sure your hands are always washed before you eat. Uh, here's another thing. Meditate on how Krishna tasted the offering. Sometimes we, we forget about this part and want to experience the prasadam. But also think, oh, this is, this is coming from Krishna. Krishna has accepted it. It's transcendental. It is mercy like that. Don't talk while honoring prasadam. <laughs> but sometimes we say, like in large groups, if you're going to speak, speak very less and speak only very light conversation. Not heavy conversation doing, not philosophical discussions or, you know, how th things are going on with the services. But I know devotees, because we take Prashadam together that are senior, we generally, when we start, we never speak. It's only towards the end of the meal when devotees have somehow or other sufficiently taken the, their prasadam, maybe they're not quite done, that some light conversation starts to arise. But at the beginning, no. At that time you want to uh, get to, into the mood of prasadam like that. And you'll find when you meditate and absorb yourself in prasadam, you start to taste it more than normally. You actually get to the essence of the taste. Mm -hmm. Do not throw prasadam. This is one of the things that I have to worry, concern myself with. Never touch prasadam with your feet. Obviously, it's like touching Krishna with your feet. Here, again, wash hands, feet, and mouth before eating. So, because we're not in India, we don't wash our feet, but at least wash your hands and mouth if you can, before and after eating, it says. That's after. Drink a glass of water one hour before eating. For some time after eating, don't drink. If you all have to drink, drink something hot. If you, they say, Ayurveda says, you can drink while you're eating, but sip. Don't drink. Sip a liquid slowly while you're eating, and that can aid your digestion. But if you're drinking while you're eating, that'll also drown out your digestion and uh, takes away from the experience of prasadam. And of course, before is not good and after is not good either. Prabhupada said, fill one quarter of your stomach with water, one half with food and the other with air. In other words, leave a little bit of room down there for circulation. Not that you follow the, what they call it, the initial principle that we first came in contact with Krishna consciousness. It's called the six month eat all you can program. <laughs> because when you come out of the material world you still have many material tendencies. So instead of trying to fulfill those tendencies in different ways, you fulfill it by just eating a lot of prasadam. But that's supposed to be only for the six, first six months. After that, you should be sufficiently purified where you don't have to do like that. How to serve prasadam? We should never waste prasad. Best thing is to cook only what is required and then give each person what he wants. This is the Vedic system that the people sit in rows behind their plates and servers pass down the rows and put a very small portion of each foodstuff on each plate. Small portion. Unless there is some objection by a person, then nothing is given. Then, if anyone wants more, the servers pass up and down the rows continually 
and give more if if there's some request. And this way, nothing is wasted, and everything is everyone is satisfied. So yeah, you serve a little bit of each, and then you go. The servers should be actively engaged in going up and down the rows. The servers don't ask you; they just they show you what they're going to serve, and you indicate either through some hand motion or some way. You're not supposed to speak. The servers are not supposed to speak either. That is the way of the etiquette. Um, when we first joined the Krishna Conscious Movement, and still in many places in ISKCON, there's a reading of some interesting philosophical uh, book. We used to read Nectar Devotion, sometimes um, Sri Upanishads or Nectar of Instructions during the meal. In other words, it keeps the focus on something transcendental. But if that's not there, then better to absorb yourself in eating like that. The idea is, it's called Sarira Avidya Jal. And remember that, that we're trying to control the tongue. So for speaking and eating at the same time, the tongue is not getting the proper treatment of control. So the control comes by absorbing itself in the process of accepting prasadam. So there's no need to speak, but like we said, sometimes when you're, there's, if there's guests, then we have a different program, because when guests don't really understand these things so well, so we have to. Sometimes we sit down with guests and we also speak during the prasadam. But that is just because it helps to make them feel comfortable like that because they don't know. But the basic etiquette for devotees in the association with each other is to remain absorbed in the, in the process of accepting Krishna in the form of food. Uh, some, some people like to eat prasadam and some people like to serve prasadam. So Prabhupada was asked, what is better? Prabhupada said, they're both the same. <laughs> Why? Because one is giving Krishna and the other one is accepting Krishna. So Krishna becomes the medium of that exchange. So whether you give Krishna in the form of prasadam or accept him in that form, it is absolute. So if you like to serve prasadam more than you like to eat prasadam, that is fine. And if you like to eat prasadam more than you like to serve prasadam, that is fine. <laughs> it's not like one is better than I. Well, he's serving and I'm eating, therefore he's better than me. No. The right consciousness is that it's an absolute exchange. And therefore, Krishna becomes the medium. And therefore, either one is equal. <laughs> Those that are served should be very clean, peaceful, and satisfied. They should eat before serving if necessary. In other words, the servers shouldn't be anxious to finish so they can get to their, pl their plates. We have the pastime of Kateri Gram, where Janava Devi, uh, the wife of Lord Nityananda, she was commissioned to cook the feast for all the devotees. There were thousands of devotees who came from Vrindavan. They came from Navadweep. And they came from Jagannath Puri to Ketri Gram to celebrate the Gaur Purnima festival. The first one after Lord Chaitanya had left it was 50 years after his departure. And people had come, it was a grand festival. Janava Devi, she uh, cooked the whole feast, and when she was done, she was out there serving all the devotees. She served everyone, and then after all the devotees were served, there were many servers, so she sat the servers down and served all the servers after she, after she served the devotees and cooked the feast. And then she took prasadam as at the last one. And she was the most exalted person in the whole assembly. She was considered to be the supreme devotee in that assembly, out of all the devotees that were there. 
Naratam Das Thakur was there, uh, Srinivas Acharya was there, uh, many of the great souls the, who had associated with Lord Chaitanya, who were still on the planet, were there. Still, Janava Devi was considered to be the most exalted and most respected. But she took the humble position of cooking for all the devotees and then serving them and becoming the last one to honor Prashadam. So she showed by example that um, although she was seen as the most exalted, she took the, the humble position of serving Vaishnavas. Like that. This is an interesting... Here's some more things about... You can, you can raise your hand or if you have questions in relationship to anything that's being said. Yes. Well, then, it's avoided by the proper etiquette where devotees who are serving, they continuously go up and down the rows, showing what is being served. And that way, when you want, whatever you want comes at one point or another. Generally, it's against the etiquette to ask for anything. It breaks the mood, yes. Well, there is considered to be, there is a, a greater spiritual potency in Mahaprasana. That's why it says in the Nectar of Devotion, and there's a, there's a thing called Maha Maha Prashadam that even has greater potency. Maha Maha Prashadam is that Prashadam that comes from the deity plate who goes to the spiritual master and then that remnants that he leaves is called Maha Maha. So in the Bhagavad, I'm sorry, in the Nectar Devotion it says, there's three things you should do anything to get. The Maha, the Maha Maha Prashadam, the dust from the lotus feet of a great soul, and the water that washes the feet of a great soul. One should do anything to get. So some devotees took that quite literally in the old days. And then when we were looking for the Maha Maha, we couldn't find it because some devotees were expert at knowing how, where it was and how to get it and keeping it for a select few. <laughs> but um, the principle is that there is, a, there is a level of spiritual, what we say, you know, anything spiritual is absolute. But then again, they say Maha Prashadam has greater mercy attached to it. <laughs> you know, just like they say, the holy name of the Lord is absolute. So if you chant Ram or you chant Krishna, it's spiritual, it's absolute. But then it says also that three names of Ram equal one name of Krishna. A uh, hundred names of Vishnu equals one name of Ram, and three names of Ram equal one name of Krishna. So, but still, from the absolute point of view, it's all spiritual. But then again, the mercy is what is the difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You had your hand? Yeah. Do we have a microphone for those? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question when it comes to the serving. Uh, is anyone allowed to serve prasadam or just uh, should be the initiated uh, devotees? No, it says here, okay. servers should be very clean, peaceful and satisfied. They should they should not try to speak while they're serving. It's more about etiquette than about position. So we, we allow, uh, but if a person doesn't know how to serve and doesn't know the etiquette, that could cause a little disturbance. So they should have some understanding of how best to serve. 
Mm -hmm. And I have a second question. Is it allowed, let's say, when we serve in, after about half an hour serve, that we can come to every devotee and maybe ask him what he wants? Yeah, towards the very end. So it's allowed, or is it uh, at against the, the etiquette, or at the very end? At the very end only. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Maharaj, is it that Matajis, that only Matajis serve the Matajis, and Prabhus Prabhus, or? Yeah, that's the etiquette. Mm -hmm. And what That's an if, easy question. Yes. <laughs> and what if uh, we mix, if we put Mahaprasadam in the same pot with the Prasadam, is it on Mahaprasadam? Mahaprasadam should always be served separately. And it should be indicated that now we will, there will be distribution of Mahaprasadam. That should be always served separately. Sometimes we mix it back with the bigger pot, but better to keep it separate and serve it like that. Because the etiquette, at least in Vedic culture, is you just take a tiny bit of Mahaprasadam because it's absolute. Whether you take one morsel or you take one plate, the spiritual benefit is the same. Yes. The rules you were telling us are for the devotees. As so how, what is the word of caution for the devotees when we give prasadam to someone who is completely new and then such a person doesn't know how to act properly with prasadam? Well, new people we can't really enforce all these rules on. These are not for new people. New people, they'll learn gradually if we set the example by our own the way we behave. But generally, for new people who come to the feast, a devotee should sit with them and speak with them so they feel comfortable. And again, we can also talk about what is being served, like that, and something like that. So, Prabhupada, and this was, gone, this was done in the early days, turned the Sunday feast into an opportunity to preach especially during the prasadam time. We got a chance to sit down with the guests and, uh, you know, ask a little bit about who they are, um, answer any of their questions, and maybe explain a little bit about prasadam while prasadam is going on. But we can't, we shouldn't force them into a kind of an etiquette because uh, it'll just cause you know, an unpleasant situation. They, you, you can't expect them to know. Mm -hmm. Here it says, seniors should be served first, householders should serve the guests, old people and children should be served first. Mm -hmm. So this is the etiquette. So generally, we children get first, along with the elderly people, then the brahmanas, and, this, and then the then guests like that, and then the general devotees. So there is a sequence for proper serving in a large group like that. Place salt and lemon on each plate before those to be before those to be served are seated. Well, this is, this is optional. Always serve water first. Hmm. Hmm. So yeah, prasadam should be served in the following order. First, bitter preparations are served first. Why? Because bitter preparations stimulate appetite. Sukta and bitter melon, then spinach and other astringent items, fried preparations and then dal, various types of vegetables, spicy, sour items, sweet preparations, rice and chapatis are staple food and should be on the plate at the beginning like that. 
So there's a, somewhat of an etiquette for serving. People who know mm, will, will follow this very carefully in terms of the sequence and how you serve food. It's important like that. Because it's actually good for digestion and it's also better for health too. Mm -hmm. Go around serving seconds until everyone is satisfied. Don't be stingy. Don't hold back anything because you want to take it later. <laughs> Prashadam is meant for distribution. Do not touch plates with a serving spoon. Mm. Okay, well, let me finish this one. Do not touch plates with a serving spoon. Touching the plate contaminates the spoon. If the spoon becomes contaminated, immediately you should wash it. Don't continue serving like that. Um, I was, one senior devotee was telling me they were living in India before they came to Krishna consciousness. They were associating with the, uh, the yogis and the ashrams. This person was living with the Babaji's and, you know, living that life. So the Babaji's, sometimes they would cook these big pieces of prasadam and they would distribute it to whoever was there. So they would line up one after another. So mm, you come up with your plate and someone has a ladle and they put the preparation, usually it's kitri, on your plate. And then you go. So this devotee, new person, wasn't a devotee yet. He came and he held his plate over the serving bucket. The person hit the plate with the kitchery and knocked the plate out of his hand into the serving bucket. There was a cry of alarm from the whole assembly. <laughs> and they had to take that whole bucket of Kitchri and throw it, which they did. And then they had to cook again because someone's plate fell into the bucket. This is how, this is the etiquette for what is called Juta Ajut. I don't know if you know this etiquette, Juta Ajut. I was telling Mark and Day about this the other day uh, when we were here. Juta Ajut is a more subtle form of cleanliness that devotees have no idea about. But it's followed by sadhus in India. And Prabhupada also mentioned it a few times. If you have something clean in this hand, and you have something dirty in this hand, this contaminates this. Example, you got your bead bag in this hand, you pick up something from the floor. No. <laughs> That's considered contaminating. It doesn't mean because I'm using a different hand, it's okay. If you have your bead bag, just like I noticed the devotees were picking up telsi leaves and holding their japa beads in the other hand. Put the beads down, pick up the telsis, go back, wash the hands, and then continue on your <coughs> with your practice. <coughs> so this is very important. Juta jute is there. Jute means... Purified, ajut means impure, pure or impure, like that. Don't let your fingers touch any of the preparations, even water. Salt should never be served by hand. Use a spoon. You had a question? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes I have a question. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Maharaj, I saw that there is one temple where uh, they uh, sell uh, Mahaprasadam, is this okay? Well, generally it's a principle not to, but there, if there's some reason, some temples are poor, <laughs> so they look for opportunities to. Mahaprasadam should never be sold, it should be given away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Automatically. Yeah, but you have to erase what we do. Yeah, yeah. 
But we have like these, uh, what they call, little purifiers around the temple. They should, you should keep purifiers in different places on the temple where you can just do that. Wipe your hands. Yeah, it's like that. Um, I've seen Prabhupada many times. I mean, I've heard Prabhupada, I've also seen it. <laughs> Say, when a person touches the floor and then immediately they touch their bees, Prabhupada said, go wash your hands. The beads are sacred, and they shouldn't be touched after the one touches because the floor is not considered to be an unclean place. Yeah, so I carry this with me. Ladies can ladies always have purses, right? They carry everything in the purse, right? You in a lady's purse, you find everything that's on the market. <laughs> There's nothing not in a lady's purse. It's completely fully stocked with everything you need. So ladies can carry some, you know, these little squirt bottles like that. Men can carry them in your pockets like that. I started a trend. I've been doing this for at least 10, 15 years now with this thing, and other people have picked up on it. But, I, you know, I'm I, anything I touch that's unclean, then immediately I, I, I wash my hands with this. Just a few little water and then wipe it off and... I mean, it's not ideal, but it's better than, you know, neglecting it. Yes? What about, um, it is said that uh, Brahmanas has all holy rivers in this uh, right lower part of the year. Uh, what about this and to what extent we can use it <laughs> to purify our hands? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, sometimes... Uh, you can wipe your hand on your earlobe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is my question. To what extent uh, we can use this? Uh, <laughs> as a principle? Um, I have to go to higher authorities for this question. <laughs> and not, is it uh, really Shastrikal or Prabhupada said about this? I never heard well, source of well, this. Well, what happens if you're not a Brahmin? Your earlobe's unpure then? Yeah. <laughs> but what is a Brahmin anyway? Brahmin is within the, within the category of the material. A Vaishnava is better than a Brahmin. Uh, I don't really, I've never come across that question before. <laughs> so I'm could a, could a little bit bereft of any, what we say, solid answer for you. I don't know, maybe Rashab would like to tackle that one. <laughs> I can't either. So just leave that one hanging for a while. Until you, until we get further instructions. It says, never touch prashadam with your feet or step over prashadam. Here's another one. Don't step over prashadam. Serve the prashadam from serving buckets. Don't drag buckets across the floor making a loud noise with pot handles and utensils, serve quietly. Yes. Uh, we not, uh, you said we should not um, distribute prasadam with our hands also, with our fingers, we should not touch it. Well, uh -huh. salt it says. Uh, salt, okay. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes we distribute maha prasadam with our hands like this. When you give prashadam, you go like this. When you receive prashadam, you're like this. You can't go like this. This is not receiving prashadam. Receiving is this way. Giving is this way. Receiving is like this. If it's done hand to hand, like that. Sometimes when I visit some devotees, they do 
to me something which makes me really annoyed. While I'm in the bathroom washing my hands, they put on the plate, my plate, any amount they think I should eat or any <coughs> preparations that I think that they think I like. Mm -hmm. They don't ask me, do you want this or that? And mm -hmm. they don't ask me how much I want. And well, then when I come to the table, I see this is too much for me and I don't like this and that. Can you com comment on this behavior? Yeah, tell them not to do it. <laughs> it's not right. You serve to please the, the person you're serving. You don't serve just to get the thing done. That's the idea. The service, you're actually interacting with that person on a spiritual plane. So again, it's Krishna receiving and Krishna accepting. So you have to, when you're serving, that person becomes your object of... In other words, you're trying to satisfy that person by serving nicely. So if they're causing you this, that means they're not really serving. They're serving their own ideas. So that should be corrected. Like that. Don't, uh, after everyone is finishing on the prasadam, clean the place immediately. This is a thing we sometimes see. The floor has got some food on it and people walk on it. This is one of the worst things possible. You're stepping on prasadam and you're dragging that prasadam into different areas. That is very, very unclean. Prabhupada, God brother Ananda, was eager to cook and serve not only Prabhupada, but all his disciples. Ananda was elderly, yet he took the position of always offering menial service. Although he spoke very little English, Prabhupada's disciples could perceive the affection of Ananda and Srila Prabhupada for each other. Ananda's communication with Srila Prabhupada's disciples was particularly manifest through his cooking and serving prasadam. There is a wonderful description is given on how Ananda would serve all the devotees. Prashadam, he, he was ideal. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are there's a few more statements about Prashadam, so but we'll just wind it up and see if there's anything else on, on this category. Did we cover honoring Prashadam, serving Prashadam, the moods, the, the etiquette, like that? Oh, here's another thing that I remember. When you're in large groups, you don't begin prasadam until everyone is seated down and then the senior devotees first take and then everyone begins their prasadam. Even if it's on your plate, you wait. I've been to many yatras in India where there's been hundreds of people we all sit down together. Nobody, nobody starts eating until everyone has got prasadam on their plate. <laughs> this is also proper etiquette. Yes, question in the back there. Da li postoji pravilo serviranja kada su bakte sjede na podu, dakle u linijama, ili po potrebi ponekad možemo servirati da bakte dolaze po prasadama? Is there a rule that when the prasadam is served that devotees need to be sitting in lines or could it also be done that devotees come to the place where the prasadam is served and then they get served? Mm. That's generally not the way it's done. But some temples have set it up like that, out of convenience, where you just bring your plate up and you go in lines. You go to Bhaktivedanta Manor, that's how they serve. You walk, you have your plate and you line up, right? And then you go like that. Uh, it seems to be something that has been adopted and somewhat acceptable in our society. I don't think it's wrong, but it's not exactly the exact mood like that. It's done out of convenience, that's all.
So I won't, I'm not for it, I'm not against it. Adata, you have a question? Yeah. Garanga has one. Yes, Maharaj, you spoke about stepping over the prashad, I mean, stepping on the prashad. We see sometimes that when there is pushpanjali, then we see, when, when we see that uh, devotees are then taking this also prashad, or like flowers that are offered to the Lord, then they, uh, you know, shower devotees with those. So they're... Flowers, are, right? You're so talking about flowers? Yeah. So is this also fancy to step over those flowers or no? Well, the flowers are everywhere. <laughs> if you can avoid stepping on the flowers, that's the best. I mean, is, is this principle of showering the flowers, is it bona fide? I mean, it's good. Showering for well, when you do paspanjali and you're offering it to the the deity, everyone throws the flowers at the same time, and there's flowers everywhere. Even on the people who are, don't supposed to get the flowers, they get it too. <laughs> so, what can you do? It's just the way it's done. But is it proper that then we take the maha flowers and then you know make a mess everywhere around or? No mess is allowed anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but <clears throat> the thing is, once the the ceremony is over, someone should devotees should clean, and not leave the flowers on the floor, <laughs> so people don't walk on them like that. But. If you're showering flowers, you just can't help it when it's flowers are everywhere, you know. Okay, so, yeah, of course. I'm doubtful that everything comes off the altar is prasada. Krishna doesn't have to accept everything. For example, if we offer Krishna pizzas and lasagnas because we like it, but we consider, okay, this is a ritual, I just have to put it in front of the deities and it will be prasadam. Is Krishna obliged to accept everything we put in front of him? Krishna is obliged to nothing but bhakti. Yeah. <laughs> um, everything should be done in a proper mood. If you want to offer these things, they are offerable, that's fine, but it should be done like you offer everything else, should be done in a proper way. But if you think in grill, well, Krishna doesn't really want pizza, and we want to offer pizza, so because Krishna doesn't want it, we'll just put it on the side here somewhere. And if he notices it, maybe he'll eat it, but if he doesn't notice it, we'll take it anyway. Is that Basically, that's your question. <laughs> I don't think this is a good attitude. We should follow the etiquette. This is up to the temple authorities to make sure the etiquette goes on when it comes to these things. If everybody does what they want and calls it, calls it in the name of devotional service, then it's not. It's not. It has to be done according to the instructions given by the spiritual teachers. We follow that principle in everything we do. And even if a person is not qualified to cook and they cook, Krishna doesn't have to accept it. We might think it's prashadam, but it's not. Therefore, those who are cooking should be very clean, they should know how to cook, and they should also observe the etiquette in the kitchen very strictly. And that means you focus 100% on cooking. When Prabhupada came in to cook one time, he cooked a feast in two hours, but he didn't speak one word, and he had about five or six devotees assisting him. He would indicate what needed to be done without speaking, never spoke through the whole time. So this is, and then when he was done, the kitchen was clean. 
it's not like the kitchen becomes, you know, like the Bowery, and then all of a sudden you leave and you go for taking prasadam, and then two days later you come back and then you think, well, we forgot to clean it. No. And that that is that is that's hell's kitchen. <laughs> Kid, Prabhupada, when he was done cooking, it was clean as when he started. That's that's the actual etiquette for cooking. And if you can't do it that way, you should not leave that kitchen until it's clean. Spotless. Two areas of the temple, two areas of the temple should be spotless and everything should be clean. The kitchen and the temple room. It says the kitchen is Krishna Radharani's favorite room. One who is one who is cooking is under the guidance of Radharani. She cooks everything for Krishna. Therefore, we become her assistant when we are when we are cooking for the for the Lord like that. So cleanliness is must be followed very strictly. Okay. So yeah, not everyone can cook. Of course, Prabhupada set the standard. Only second initiates can cook for the deities. We should maintain that schedule, or that that principle. But in some places, I've seen where they've lowered that and had first initiates cooking. But it says Krishna doesn't have to accept it. If we don't follow the instructions of the spiritual master, you can't serve Krishna. There's no way. Because <laughs> Krishna accepts what we offer based on our bhakti, and of course, and part of that bhakti is find and following the instructions according to how we should serve in this particular way. That's why we're talking about etiquette. Etiquette is the is the protocol for everything we do. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have uh, three more questions here coming up. Mm -hmm. Some de some devotee cook uh, for guru before initiation. What is this? Well. If the, the guru has a, spe, a, a private cook, that's something different. That's something that has just come into our society like that, where it's not the best, but I know one, one spiritual master, he won't, he won't eat anything unless people follow, chant 16 rounds and follow the four regulative principles. He will not accept anything less from anybody who are not, who's not us, chanting 16 rounds and following four regulative principles. So that's a high standard. <laughs> that's, on, uh, that's for his personal prasadam like that. Because the consciousness of the cook goes into the food when you're cooking. Just like Indrajumna Maharaj uh, responded to one of his cooks and she had cooked for him and then after a while he came back to her and he said are you listening to the Beatles? And she said how did you know? I tasted it. <laughs> So yeah, your consciousness goes into the cooking. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I have experienced that too. If I eat certain foods cooked by certain people, we get certain kinds of dreams. Sometimes, yeah, and sometimes we get these horrible dreams and sometimes we get other kinds of dreams. That's why devotees should be qualified to cook like that. That means they're following the standards like that. If you if you if a pure devotee cooks for you, you're going to have dreams of Krishna and Vrindavan. <laughs> but if somebody else cooks for you, you might have something from Pratala Loka. So, because especially grains, grains absorb consciousness. 
I, I think this is very difficult for Guru. Hmm? I think this is very difficult for, for this Guru. Yeah, it is difficult, but I think the spiritual master, if he has his own cooks, will have to decide who can cook and who cannot cook. Like that, but when it comes to temple, that's a whole different a standard. Then. Any other questions? Ja sam želio pitati da li postoji i kakva je zapravo razlika kuhanja za Krišnu u hramu i kod kuće, kod grihasta, jer mi smo imali slučaj da smo pripremali zdravu hranu za prodaju, pa se moralo pripremati ne možda baš sve ono ne sabđi ili nešto što bi volio Krišna, nek smo pripremali ono što je išlo u tu svrhu. Pa me zanima da nešto kažete o toj razlici kod kuće i u hramu. I wanted to ask is there some difference between the standard of cooking in the temple and cooking at home like grihastas cook at home for example sometimes we needed to prepare some healthy things for some occasions that are not maybe the standard things that we would offer to Krishna. Yeah. So is you have there to, some difference? The most important thing about standards, especially when you're using standards outside of the temple, is that you follow two principles very clearly. One is cleanliness. And that's the most important thing. Make sure you're clean and keep everything clean. And the second thing is that you should always do everything on time. If you have deities at home, then you have to offer, make sure you follow that time period. If you're not following the time period, then you can't worship Radha and Krishna at home. Radha and Krishna. Gornitai had, there's a little bit more flexibility. But generally, keep everything clean, keep everything on time. There is a little extra leeway, what we say, leadway, in cooking at home as opposed to the temple. And within the temple, depending on the deities you have, you know, Radha and Krishna have to have the highest standard. Jagannath is one step lower. Gornitai is a little less as far as standards. Yes, you have a question? Or, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, can you please, uh, Maharaj, repeat what's the mood when you are serving prasadam? The mood is to please the person you're serving by doing it in the ni nicest possible way and not disturb the person's eating by being loud, by being sloppy, by being talkative. Prashada means you absorb yourself in that mood of taking, honoring Krishna's prashada. <laughs> When you're at home, it's a little different. There's some, you can, it's a more relaxed atmosphere, that's different. Here in the temple, strict. <laughs> okay, can we go on to another category of etiquette? Yeah. Does anyone, yes? Uh, no, this other category, I just like suggest uh, maybe this how address to other devotees, maybe. What's that? You ask other categories, yeah. And how, uh, one was uh, how address to other devotees, something like that. Correct or address? Let's see here. Other devotees. Let's see here. 
Okay, let's... Uh, <laughs> I think, let's see, I, I made a, I, I gave a listing, oh, it says here, serving guests and life members, correcting others, etiquette in holy places, in public, kirtan etiquette, temple room etiquette, let's talk about temple room etiquette. Okay, since this is the, one of my favorites. <laughs> okay, somehow or other we got our pages mixed up here. Lordy. Mm, I'm no good with it. All this paperwork here, 39. Okay, temple room etiquette. Okay, temple room etiquette is described in detail by Srila Prabhupada in Nectar Devotion. Here, Prabhupada. Another thing I request is that everything in the temple should be kept nice and clean. So the word nice means neat in its place. Everything, everyone should wash hands before touching anything of Krishna's. We should always remember that Krishna is purest and similarly only the purest can associate with him. Cleanliness is next to godliness. There is no matter if there is a little change here and there. The real duty is love and devotion. Hmm. Okay. Temple room etiquette here. 38. Let's see, I think something here is missing. Well, I can remember from my experiences with nectar of devotion that there are certain principles in temple red and again, and I'll just do it from what I can remember. One is we have that bell there. Um, the temple is the dwelling place of the Lord. So just like when you go to a person's house, you ring their bell or you knock on their door. So here we announce our presence by ringing a bell or if there's no bell, you knock on the door or on, on the area of the door before you come in. You pay obeisances and then you go to Prabhupada and pay obeisances, then you pay obeisances to the deities. Sitting in the temple room means to sit in a proper way, either sit in a chair or sit cross-legged on the floor. If we sit cross-legged on the floor, we should never extend our feet straight out. And that is considered to be, um, there's one, that, that one, uh, one demon that was killed by Krishna called Aristasura. He was a bull. So he was a devotee in a previous life. His guru, he came before his guru Maharaj and he sat with his legs straight out. His guru said, you sit like a bull, become a bull. <laughs> so he had to take birth. As a demon, he was killed by Krishna and Vrindavan. Anyway, he got liberation. Uh, sit straight. And don't wrap your arms around your knees like you're doing there. That's wrong. You, you can't do that. That's, they, that's, that is against temple etiquette. Um, don't speak loudly in the temple. In other words, if you have to speak conversation with something, someone speaks softly. Um, don't criticize another person in front of the deities or, in, or instruct people in front of the deities. They say you shouldn't even instruct another person in front of the deities. Um, don't tell lies in front of the deities. Don't pass air while in the temple. 
What's another one? These are some of the basic things. Um, the temple is the place, when the deities are open, it's even more stricter. The etiquette, always be in a proper mood. Uh, paying obeisances means paying with, we call it five points, or um, actually seven points or 11 points. Dunda wants is 11 points. Seven points is regular obeisances. In other words, we touch certain parts of the body onto the floor. When you pay obeisances, it's one of the main principles of bhakti. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, manmana bhava mad bhakto, mam yuji mam namaskuru, mam ivaisyasi satyam te pratichino priyosi me. Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me, offer your homage to me. So Prabhupada says these four principles make up the entire activities of devotional service. So paying homage means paying obeisances, respects to devotees, to the deities, to the spiritual master. So when we do that, it's not just a ritual or something to get over with like that. We should be done in the right mood. Um, ladies don't pay full dandavats. Men can or not pay full dandavats. But when we go down there, we recite the mantra given to us by our spiritual master, which is usually the pranam mantra of our spiritual master. Or, if we haven't received that yet, we recite, receive Prabhupada's pranam mantra. Or you can recite both mantras, both your spiritual master's pranam mantra and Prabhupada's mantra. They say you should recite it out loud course we don't do that but that's the actual etiquette it should be heard and that is obeisances like that um, Prabhupada criticized us when he saw devotees just bowing their head to the floor and coming back up really quick he said what is this hatchet you know what a hatchet is you know what an axe is an axe, a hatchet is a small axe, that's all. So when you use an axe, you chop wood and you go, and you bring it back up. So Prabhupada said, what is this hatchet? <laughs> so you, and I've seen devotees, they don't even make it to the floor. They get close. <laughs> like that. It seems to be a botheration. If you're too old and you have lumbago, or Parkinson's, or some other ill, and you can't pay obeisances, at least make the gesture like this, and do it properly, like that. So, uh, temple etiquette is important, like that. Um, when you're standing before the deities, you should understand that the deity is Krishna, Arche Vishnu Siladi Guru Shuno Mati Vaishnava Jati Bhuti. That the deity is not simply made out of some element of this world, although the forms are formed out of these elements, but the deity actually enters into the into the form made by the devotees, and then that deity becomes eternally the Lord. The deity is not an eternal manifestation, but at one time it becomes eternal. In other words, once the deity is installed and the worship begins, then that is the Lord, like that. But the Lord can also leave the deity too, if the worship goes so far down that sometimes there is examples where Krishna will inspire people to steal him to get him to get to take him away from the devo devotees. Somebody comes in, steals the deity. The deity burns up in the fire. The deity falls over and breaks. This has happened many times. If this happens, this is an indication that the worship is really at a bad state of affairs. Hopefully you don't get to that level. But we should always un keep the, the consciousness that this is Lord Chaitanya. 
that is Lord Nityananda. We offer our respects. When we when the curtains curtains open, what is the proper way to receive the deity for darshan? Actually, the word darshan comes from the word drishta. There is drishta and drasha. Drasha and drishta means one who is seen and one who is being seen. So darshan actually means the Lord sees you. <laughs> That's actually darshan. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta was standing in front of the deities. He had forgotten his glasses. And therefore, one brahmachari came up and said, Guru Maharaj, should I get your glasses? He said, don't bother. What can we see? <laughs> we have to be seen by Krishna. In other words, we present ourselves in such a way before the Lord that the Lord wants to see us. That's the mood of darshan. When the temple open, when the curtains opens, you you don't hit the floor before, you know, like a dive bombing, like off off a diving board, you know. And the curtains open and people go flat on the floor, and the first one to the floor wins, right? <laughs> that's not the, that's not the way you do it. When the curtains open, you stand there and you greet the Lord with folded hands. You look at his feet, you raise your eyes up to his face, and you bring it down, then you offer obeisances. That's how you do it. You know, like Radharani and Krishna are standing there, and the curtains open, and Krishna says, where did they go? Oh, they're down there. Oh. Mm -hmm. Radharani said, yeah, yeah, they, they, they couldn't wait to get there. So we have to understand that you greet the Lord when he appears with folded hands, bring your eyes to the feet, up to the face and down in a very quick way, you know, naturally. And then we'll pay obeisances. When you're standing and the darshan is going on, such as darshan arti, three, con three questions come to your mind. Sometimes you stand there and think, what should I do now? <laughs> Uh, how's it going, Krishna? How, what's what's new with you and Radha? You know, you, you don't really get into that like that. So you stand there and you th you 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 say, "My dear Lord, uh, I am so fallen." And uh, you describe how fallen you are. <laughs> some that might be hard for some of us, but uh, but we have to do through that. And then you also can glorify the Lord's qualities and characteristics, his pastimes in your mind. You think of the glories of the Lord and something you remember about his glories or maybe the way he's dressed like that. And the last thing you say, how can I serve you? <laughs> Three things, glorification of the Lord, uh, admitting your falling position, how can I serve you? That is the proper etiquette for greeting the deities. Not like you just stand there and think, well, what's next? <laughs> we have to have a proper mood when we receive the deities like that. Yeah. When we enter the temple room in the morning before Mangalarati, of course, we go to Śrīla Prabhupāda, we offer obeisances to Śrīla Prabhupāda. But are we supposed to offer the obeisances to the deities while the curtain is closed? Some, some devotees say this is offensive. No, it's not wrong. It's done. In other words, you're going, you, you, you have to offer obeisances, so the deities are not visible, so you can offer to a close. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a respectful etiquette that the deity is there. It's only the curtain that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay. It's not, how I don't know how it would be considered to be offensive. Is it wrong? Just following his questions, a question: Is it wrong if we don't offer obeisances? Uh, it's I never heard of it being wrong, no. 
But it seems like it's the thing to do out of respect. I don't think it's offense by neglect. It doesn't seem to be. It's not mentioned in. If it would be, if it was, it would be mentioned. But it's not mentioned. Okay, one for the ladies' side. We have one over there. Mm. Thank you. Just uh, about following <laughs> the other's questions. Uh, what about if the deities are asleep? What about them? Well, you mean in Do the we temples? Do we pay obeisances to them or not? Or just the Srila Prabhupada? Uh, it's Will okay. You mean if the temple, the curtain is closed and the deities are asleep? You're not going to wake them up, don't worry. You can just pay your obeisances there, that's nice. You can pay your obeisances to the Lord anytime, anywhere. Krishna is everywhere. He's in your heart, he's within every atom, he's in every, you know. There's no rule for paying obeisances. <laughs> That can happen anywhere at any time. And so if you want to offer to your respects to the deity, even though the deity is sleeping, there is no restriction for that. It's okay. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah, okay. You don't look so pleased with my answer. <laughs> okay. Thank you for showing some signs. <laughs> If if you don't, if the answer somehow doesn't what we say fit, just let me know. The question is, uh, what about sleeping in the same room where the DT is, especially at home, if there is somehow a necessity to do that? Is that all right? And also for the temple, for the temple room, is it okay for someone to sleep inside the temple room? Just don't snore. <laughs> Of course, you don't know if you're doing it anyway. <laughs> I uh, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> there there is some temples that, because of crowded conditions, they sleep in the temple room. At home, I think you should find a place to sleep. <laughs> I don't think if you have a house and you can't find a place to sleep, then you need a bigger house. <laughs> Or if you can't find a place to sleep, just knock on your neighbor's door. <laughs> because, although I don't know, but every time I pass somebody who's sleeping, I always hear this sawing of wood, you know. <sighs> that would be... <laughs> That would be considered to be really obnoxious in the deity room to be snoring. <laughs> or, you know, sleeping is not a very clean affair because they say, that's why they say any clothes you sleep in are already contaminated, can never be used other than for sleeping and should be washed regularly. Because when you sleep, your body exudes contaminations. It comes out through the skin, it comes out through the pores like that. So sleeping is not a real suchi affair. So better not to sleep in the deity room. Sleep in the kitchen. <laughs> and that would be more appropriate. 
Any other questions about temple room etiquette? Yes, we have one from Hemogori. Krishna Maharaj. In some temples, I saw that uh, first, uh, when a person comes to temple, they offer obeisances to the Vaishnavas if they are sitting in the temple room. And also, I saw a beautiful gesture of Vaishnavas giving Dandavas both to each other simultaneously when the person is entering the room and then the person entering the room offer obeisances to Prabhupada and deities. So the question is? So is it like okay to first offer obeisances to all the Vaishnavas you yeah. see and then Prabhupada? That, and yeah, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine, yeah. First, offer, you come in and the Vaishnavas are there, and you pay your obeisances to the Vaishnavas. And then go to Prabhupada and then to the deities, like that. Yeah. That's usually the etiquette, like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we are, for example, doing some kind of service, cleaning at a temple or uh, picking tulasi leaves, is it, and we are going in and out of the temple room, is it okay not to pay obeisances every single time? Well, that's up to you. <laughs> I think in certain cases it would, it would be difficult to follow that. In other cases it would be okay. I know Prabhupada instructed his personal servants when they were coming in and out to serve him to, to, to pay obeisances coming in and coming out. But Prabhupada was really teaching us at the beginning the importance of the importance of honoring the spiritual master. But for temple room, I think if you are doing some seva, and then uh, walking in and out is fine, as long as it's done in the proper, with the proper. In other words, you know, you're avoiding acting carelessly or passionately. Like that. You should always act in the proper mood when you're in the temple, even if you're cleaning. Also, like that. I think it's. I would say it's fine to do that if you're in a mood because you're doing seva and. That is also, that's the important thing you're doing, Seva. Yes. According to this uh, uh, previous answer, um, uh, if we meet uh, sannyasi in temple room, so this is okay to first offer Obeisance is to sannyasi, then after this to Prabhupada and deities. Or you mean if the, if the yeah if the if the if the curtains are closed, yeah. Okay. If the curtains are open, you can only pay your obeisances to your guru in the temple room in front of the deities. Mm -hmm. You can't pay your obeisances to any other senior devotee. When the temple, when the deities are open, unless it's your spiritual master, <laughs> because the injunction is, no, no one should be offering obeisances to anyone in front of the deities. That's the injunction. But the sub-injunction is, because the spiritual master represents the supreme Lord in your life, you can also, even during the worship ceremony, if if worship is going on. And you walk in and your spiritual master is there in the worship, you can offer obeisances to him and then to the deities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Something about, something about uh, uh, doing round about Tulsi Devi. And most of the time we are coming in front of Prabhupada and doing some small cycle like this. Actually, I think that this is that we not uh, 
put our uh, back, back to, to one. yeah. But most of time we can see that some, uh, mostly from Indian people, are coming in front of deity and uh, doing some uh, cycle around the deities. And uh, also the second question is about around uh, the deities. Yep. In front of the deities. Front of the deities. Front of deities. Well, well, let me answer that. You're not supposed to circumambulate in front of the deities. That's mentioned in nectar devotion. That's considered to be wrong or improper etiquette. For Tulsi Devi, Tulsi generally is not worshipped when the curtains are open. That's why we always close the curtains for Tulsi worship. One of the things devotees should not do is bang into Tulsi, touch Tulsi while you're going around. <coughs> Prabhupada has many times uh, called attention to that. Why you don't don't walk into Tulsi? She's a pure devotee. Like that. But doing that little turnabout so you don't keep your back to Prabhupada is fine. That's nice. Turnabout is another way to offer respects. That's done sometimes just impromptu. Sometimes we stand in front of the deities and we do a turnabout. That means you're offering respects to the deities in front of the deities like that. Okay, small one question also. And uh, if we watering Tulsi, most of time uh, devotee Tulsi, you teach us how to say it. Don't, Tulsi. Dr don't drown her. Tulsi or Tulasi, not Tulasi. Two Lassies, give me two Lassies. I had, I had one, I had one Lassie, but I'm still thirsty. Give me two Lassies. <laughs> and then uh, it's not two Lassie. It's Tulsi hmm. or Tulasi. Tula Tulasi. The emphasis is on the last syllable, not on the a. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we're watering, uh, sometimes devotee taking this left hand and uh, touching right, and then uh, watering, and most of the time uh, some devotees also serving prasadam like this. What is that supposed to mean? I don't that know. Touching your left hand to your right hand? Something what, like that. What does that mean? I don't know. But uh, some, some devotee is doing that. It's, uh, what does it mean? Senior also. Well, because the right hand is shaking, they're, tr <laughs> no, they're trying to keep it from shaking. I don't understand that one. That one, that one is somebody's else, somebody's new Purana. They just in career. It's called per Bhagavad Gita, as I see it. <laughs> that's not. That's no. It's just. And this thing too, we, we, everybody, you, know, you get all this new stuff, you know. You you go to a flower and you're going to offer a flower to somebody and you put it to their head first. Oh, where did you get that from? You just Here's where you're smelling. You, your nose is not up here. This is, this is coming from the hippies. Is we, the thing is, you have to understand. And Prabhupada told us, like, yeah, whatever you do, do something new. <laughs> change for the sake of change. He said, walk on your hands, but whatever you do, change. <laughs> In other words, the Western disease is to change everything. <laughs> it's a Western disease. India is starting to pick up on that now. <clears throat> One small question, if I can, or yeah, did you get the did you get the answer to the last one? They say before you can eat more, you have to digest what you already ate. Okay. Okay. Yeah, did you get the answers to those questions? The second part is that there's no meaning to that holding left arm, left hand on the right arm. There's nothing. I don't know where that came from. When we have a, a, from altar a ghee lamp and bring it to Srila Prabhupada, should we give him a, on the hand no. or hand on the uh, head? Keep, make sure you don't put it too close to your hands because you'll find that the hands are made of a certain 
material and you'll start, that material will start cracking. So keep it away from the hands. I, we saw that in many temples that the hands need repairing because people are putting the ghee lamp too close to the hands. And that's important. So just hold it in front of Prabhupada, that's all. Oh. That's fine. Not to head, not to hand, just hold. Mm, yeah, just go within range and keep it at a safe distance, that's all. Because you have to understand that it's although it's Prabhupada, it's still a deity and it's made out of a certain material. You don't want to put f f heat near that material. It's just not good. <laughs> Uh, I have a question, Maharaj. Uh, when we are picking uh, tulsi leaves from the temple floor, uh, is it allowed to put, let's say, take a leaf and put it in the left hand, then take another and put it in the left hand? Yeah, why not? That's okay. That's and, okay. Yeah. Yes, and then after we pick all the picked up all the tulsi leaves. Uh, is it now we need to wash our hands then uh, uh, before touching touching japa? Yeah, oh. because you're touching the floor. That's the principle. Uh huh. Okay. And those Thank tulsi leaves can they have to be if they're still green? Then they have to be washed before they can be offered. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You, if you just remember certain things, you'll understand what to do. And that is, everything should be done in a mood of cleanliness. Cleanliness should be the, the concern. And doing it very, very nicely. Even if you make a mistake, if you keep, it, keep everything clean and do it nicely in a nice mood, devotional mood, then you start to understand, you know, the etiquette. It starts to become clear. We list all the rules and regulations, but not everybody can remember all the rules and regulations. The most important thing is consciousness. If your consciousness is in the right mood, then when you're in the temple, everything will be, what we say, done in a devotional way. Keep the right mood. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is from Savitri? Uh, from me. Oh, from you, okay. Uh, when you mentioned this injunction that one should not circumambulate in front of the deity, does it mean that literally one should not go in circles like when dancing, or does it specifically mean that one should not offer obeisances in that way by circumambulating someone like Tulsi Devi or someone else? No, of course, generally we do that sometimes, but I, it does say in a nectar devotion, one should not circumambulate in front of the deities. How that's understood, in other words, if, you, if, you do, if you're going around in circles in the area of the temple, and you're doing it in front of the deities, it's considered to be outside of the proper etiquette. I think we'd have to investigate that one a little bit more for clarification. Da li u redu kod kuće kad obožavam božanstva istovremeno nudi tarotik i tulsi devi? Is it okay when we are doing arati at home to simultaneously offer an arati to tulsi devi also? You mean to the deities and tulsi at the same time? Well, when we offer arati to the deities, we also offer that same article to Tulsi, that's part of the art, artsy, yeah. Just like those who do the artsy on the offering altar, when they finish with the deities, then they offer to Tulsi, 
Prabhupada and the symbol of devotees. That is the etiquette like that. The Pujari sh should know that, that, that when they finish with the deities, then they turn to Tulsi, and then they turn to Prabhupada, and then they turn to the assembly of devotees. And they offer two, three, three circles like that to each of those. <laughs> uh, I would like to a que have. Um, I would to. Uh, <laughs> I would like to have to ask a question, uh, Maharaj. Let's say that two devotees are making here service in the temple. Are they allowed to speak to each other or to share something? If you work, if you're doing a service and there's some necessi necessity to speak, of course, yeah. I mean, if like it has, if it's really service related, yeah. But if it's not service related, better not to speak. <laughs> so basically, let's say if two guys are cleaning the temple room floor, it's better to do it in silence and to speak to each other. Well, if it, like I said, if it's, it's if it pertains to the service. And there's a, there's a necessity, necessity to speak. If it doesn't pertain to the service, then there's no need to speak. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other categories you want to uh, approach? Correcting to devotees. Hmm? <laughs> well? Correcting to devotees. <laughs> okay, it's okay. But... Correcting devotees. Okay, we'll get to that one. Correcting devotees, page. Correcting devotees. So we can get into this one. Devotee means he is able to tolerate all discomforts and whims of the material nature. And because he's too much absorbed in serving Krishna, he takes no time to become angry or take offense with others to find out some fault. No, no. Devotee means very liberal and kind to everyone, always gentlemen under all conditions of life. That was a letter by Srila Prabhupada. There is a difference between criticism and correction. A devotee realizes that criticizing a Vaishnava pollutes the heart and impedes spiritual advancement. To correct a devotee, one must be one, non-envious. Two, desires to practically assist the devotee in his Krishna consciousness. Three, in a position spiritually or managerial which justifies and or necessitates such an intervention. To correct the devotee, one must be non-envious, desirous to practically assist the devotee in his Krishna consciousness. In a position of spiritual or, man or manage ma managerial, and like that. Okay, so that's the... Uh, the devotee uh, the devotee offering correction must be practicing what he's trying to correct others. <laughs> if you're not correcting, if you're practicing, you're not practicing what you're trying to do, then it becomes somewhat pretentious. It becomes somewhat hypocritical. Methods of correction. Correct by personal example. As we said, example is higher than precept. Correct by personal example and association. Guide a devotee to the shelter of a more advanced devotee. Sometimes we have to give that correction to someone else to do it. A junior devotee should not personally attempt to correct another devotee. He should reveal his heart to a senior devotee who he feels at ease with and seek his assistance, advice to adjust the situation. Harsh words and actions have no place in correcting a sincere devotee. We want to destroy the ignorance in the heart of a devotee and not destroy the devotee himself. If there is some sincere and honest criticism offered, we should be grateful, not upset. To react negatively to well-intentioned correction is to manifest false ego. An advanced Vaishnava will see each and every correction offered as the mercy of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Prevention 
is better than cure if all devotees take up the responsibility to, de to develop proper awareness in their devotional behavior the need for correction will be minimized then we have some quotes from Prabhupada so that's just general statements anything in regarding those statements uh, about correction yes Bhagavan You have mentioned, uh, you have just read how uh, one needs to be in a position to correct other, either spiritual or managerial. Uh, is um, when, how to say it, <laughs> um, sometimes uh, there is managerial uh, confusion. <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another problem. I mean, but, who's the manager and who's not? Uh, yeah, maybe it's not clear or things like that. Well, that, that's 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 a that's a fault. If there's no manager, then how the temple means management. Without a manager, there's no there's no management. <laughs> the word to manager and management go together. You can't say, well, everybody comes in, they do what they want, and then we hope everything goes on all right. <laughs> this, is, this is called mismanagement. You have to have an on-hands, daily, 24-hour temple manager. That has to be there. A temple otherwise cannot function without someone overseeing the activities in the temple. It's just not possible. <clears throat> when it's not when things are not managed, things don't get done, things get done in the wrong way, it becomes a problem in so many ways. Jai Sri Sri Gornitai Ki Jai. So I mean Prabhupada made so many letters on management. You have to have a manager. It's just, it's mandatory. Otherwise, it's, things don't work. <laughs> because people need to know what to do and be, what we say, guided. A manager oversees and makes things everything, maybe oversees and makes things sure that everything goes on nicely. So we have temple president and temple commander. Commander is more like the, man the hands-on manager. Temple president is more like the overall manager. <clears throat> there has to be division of labor, otherwise, good luck. No luck. It's not, it's just, I've seen temples that don't have any management and then uh, you want to get out of there as fast as you can, <laughs> because things stay, things don't get cleaned, things don't get done, things get done in the wrong way. When guests come, there's nobody to guide the guests, to instruct the guests, to make them feel welcome. You have to have a temple manager. It's not optional. <laughs> Uh, I want to ask a question, uh, Maharaj. What's the mood? Um, how to accept the uh, correction? Here and from whom? It says here, uh, a, a vi an advanced Vaishnava, it says, will see each and every correction offered as the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. So when you're getting corrected, see it as the mercy of the Lord coming through that person. Listen carefully what is being said and see how you can learn from that. It says here, uh, uh, let's see where it says. If there's some sincere and honest criticism offered, we should be grateful, not upset. 
to react negatively to well-intentioned correction is to manifest our false ego. Mm -hmm. So, even if you think it's unfair, you can understand there's always something in it where you can learn from, you can grow from. Even if it's not so much about the incident, it may be something about the mood. You can, you can learn how to develop the right mood. So, the devotee is, you know, welcomes correction because in that way they can advance. The false ego doesn't want to be corrected, but the soul wants to be purified, so the intelligent person will accept corrections as something that is beneficial. Maharaj, um, this regarding the false ego, it's I found it especially hard when I was in situations um, when I had experienced that my immediate authority, not necessarily the temple manager nor the temple president, but someone who's directly above me telling me what to do, um, I experienced as a, as like a sort of manipulation, like the person had an agenda different from what he was saying. Like telling me things in order to get me to do certain services that, you know. Well, if that person is not your designated manager, then, then really you're not obliged. But if you if you're working under the guidance of somebody, then you should follow. But nobody can surreptitiously or what we say perfunctorily just put themselves in a position of uh, what we say guiding others. We can offer some friendly guidance, but that's done on a that's done on, on a basis of just you know that's not in an official way. So when you f when you feel that agenda mood coming through, the, the tendency is to uh, to uh, become defensive. But if you can somehow rather see what they're saying and not worry about the agenda so much, maybe you can benefit from that. It's their problem. <laughs> it's not yours. <laughs> Come on in. Very well. Welcome. Okay, anything else? Yeah, so any other categories? Should I read some quotes from Prabhupada about correcting? This is a letter. A devotee who is humble doesn't find fault. Humble devotee doesn't find fault with others. Another one. So in your letter, you're not finding fault with anyone. So you're a good Vaishnava. You do not find fault with anyone. This is the qualification. We should always think ourselves humble and meek this must this you must know so we are all have to cooperate amongst ourselves otherwise what will people think if our, if we ourselves are fighting with one another the devotee is always ideal in behavior this is called vaikuntha attitude in the vaikuntha factually there is no fault in anyone but there is another time of competition the competition is that one devotee thinks of the other devotees how nicely they are serving the Lord. In the material world, the attitude is that everyone likes to think that I am doing better than others. This is the material conception. In the spiritual sky, it is just the opposite. Everyone thinks that my contemporary devotees are doing better than me. We are trained to address God-brothers as Prabhu, which means Master. 
This means we should try to find out always the serving side of our God, the brothers. Sometimes there's our misgivings, but we should try to overlook them. And Prabhupada had to deal with that a lot. In America, it was tough because the Americans have big false egos. So when Prabhupada was working with the, with the Americans and trying to make them Vaishnavas, he saw that they were fighting amongst themselves a lot. Prabhupada had to deal with that. And so he, he, he gave a lot of instructions in that regard. Like that. So, yeah, but we have to somehow or other develop the proper mood. The mood is that I'm servant and everyone is serving more than I am and I should appreciate that their association, I should appreciate their service. If someone is not following the principles and chanting 16 rounds, then if someone is lacking in that, then you can try to induce them in a peaceful way. In other words, tr your correction or your advice should be done very peacefully and respectfully. Regarding some misbehavior, that we have to check by training peacefully. Your attitude of tolerance and kindness is very nice, so train them in that way. That was a letter to Bhavananda. Yes, a new man may com commit blunders in the beginning, but that does not mean we, sh we may not be too impatient with him. After all, training means the man does not know, so you should train them nicely. A Vaishnava is expected to be humbler than the blade of grass, so when you train a new man, you should get, not get agitated with him. After all, we are preachers. We do not expect our audience or candidates to be completely respondents to our call. If everyone is trained already, then what is the use of our preaching? Baba says, mend them, but don't break them. <laughs> In other words, you have to know how to correct a person without breaking a person. Okay, now some practical things. <laughs> Most of times you said it's best that uh, we preach with our example. And Markandeya Rishi Prabhuji always clean after him uh, everything and he think that he will inspire other devotees but most of the time he and me are very disappointed when we see that uh, nobody will not do even if they see him. And after sometimes we must correct them and remind them that they must also clean this and that. But, this is the first question, that sometimes not working uh, by, by example. Another Question is, what if we, on nicely, softly, softly way, we correct person? It's not working. I think that sometimes we must uh, unsoftly, un a little bit hard, uh, correct them because we saw that not work. This is the second question. Yeah, that's natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone has to. When you, if you're living in the temple, you have to be. Super clean. Prabhupada said revolutionary clean. Clothes, your body, the temple, everything you own, very neat, very clean, not too much. Hmm. This is a, this is Vaishnav culture. It's Brahminical culture also. Like that. You okay down there? You want to sit in the chair? You sure? Okay. I'm happy to see you too. <laughs> okay. 
Good, yeah, it was a night. Everyone came out with good numbers tonight. Good. Right. Yeah, they say you if somebody's in the shower you shouldn't clean you shouldn't criticize them because they're not clean yet. <laughs> they're in the shower. <laughs> they're getting clean. But someone who's not come to the shower yet <laughs> that's another problem. Mm. When you when you want, when you understand that your your spiritual uh, inspiration and knowledge is comes th from Krishna through the association of devotees, then you realize that devotees give you so much. Mm -hmm. You should develop friendships with some devotees and be friendly with all devotees. You can't be friendly with all devotees, but you can develop friendship with some. You can be friendly with all devotees, but be be a friend with some. Yeah, devotees are rare. When you lose the association of devotees, then you understand. <laughs> this lockdown has helped us to appreciate association of devotees more. Yeah, we have a question over there. Uh, I wanted to ask a question regarding this not finding faults. Um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, I think, mentions this in, uh, himself in Chaitanya Charitamrita. He instructs us not to find faults with others. But does this mean that we, should, that we shouldn't see the faults in our uh, superiors? Well, when you see, you should just forget about it. Hmm. They say you... When you see faults, look for good qualities. It's not so. These things are. Bhakti Siddhanta says when you see faults in you, and you see faults in others, look within yourself and see what is causing you to become disturbed by that. Think about that one. When you see faults in others and you're becoming disturbed, look inside yourself and see what is the cause of that disturbance. That's real introspection. So, yeah, I mean, if someone's fall is disturbing the environment, then something has to be done to correct that. But in general, we have good qualities, we have faults. It's not so important to focus on the faults, focus on the good qualities. Okay, so that was correcting others. There's a few more statements. Should I read it? Mend it, don't break it. Try to settle up amicably and correct yourself. One man is trained up with great difficulty, especially in spiritual life. Everyone has got some weakness and deficiency. It is better to correct or mend than to break. Sometimes when somebody's fault disturbs you and it's, it's, it's within the temple room environment, what you can do is you go to the authorities and let them handle it. You may not be able to do it yourself. Uh, Prabhupada said, if, you get, if someone is criticizing you and you become upset, Prabhupada says... Uh, and, you know, you should see what, if it's some honest criticism, then don't become upset. In other words, you have to determine whether it's honest or not. 
Okay. The material nature is the world of exploitation, but the spiritual nature is the world of service. This is a very important. In the material world, everyone's trying to gain something, exploit each other, exploit nature. Spiritual world, we're trying to serve Krishna, serve nature, serve each other. ISKCON is a spiritual organization, regardless of position, everyone is first and foremost a servant of the Lord and the servant of one's spiritual master. No one should exploit one's position for one's self-interest. This is called educated management. Higher position means greater service. So the higher you have a position, the greater the service. Position means an opportunity to purely represent Srila Prabhupada. Hence, our management must be based on humility and tolerance. Treat your subordinates as your younger brothers and sisters. Leadership is based on spiritual qualification, not on anything material. Leadership is based on spiritual quality, not on a mature, dedicated preacher makes the best leader. So, one has a position of leadership, but they don't have any spiritual qualities, then that's a, that's a dichotomy. Leaders must feel for their followers, and the followers will naturally trust the leaders. Mm -hmm. If you don't care about, you, all you care about is the work rather than the person. Make sure the work gets done and use the people in order to get the work done. That is not management. You should be concerned. In management in the secular world, world is you get a job and you have to do your work. If you don't do your work, you're not up to the standards, they get someone else. This is not management in the spiritual world, spiritual circles. We have to be concerned of how the devotee is advancing in their, in their Krishna consciousness, at the same time engaging in them in service. So we are all, we're, we're more concerned about the devotee than we are about the service, but both have to go on simultaneously. So that was one of the biggest criticism in the early days of our movement, too much emphasis on the services and not much concerned about the devotees. It still goes on and to some to some degree. A leader's character must be spotless. No one can find fault with that person. Leaders must feel for their followers. Okay. It is important to lead with the det detachment and guide with a strong sense of duty. In other words, when you're giving instructions, you know, you have to be a little bit detached from the idea that everyone will follow your instructions. And guide with a strong sense of duty. In other words, in other words, explain that the importance of doing your duty, but be detached from the results. Krishna conscious man management is autocratic, not democratic. <laughs> <laughs> Krishna conscious management is autocratic, not and oh, I'm sorry. Krishna conscious management is autocratic and democratic. I'm sorry. <laughs> I read it wrong. <laughs> Maybe that's me. <laughs> Krishna conscious management is autocratic and democratic. So, did you get that? I mean, as far as how it works? Okay. Talk to devotees and be open to new ideas. Don't hide anything from the Vaishnavas. There should be more than one signer for bank accounts. Ooh. Not some, just one signer on the bank account. It is best if all coming funds are declared before the deities, Srila Prabhupada and the Vaishnavas. All incoming funds should be deposited in the banks and then spent f from the account. Not that you collect it, put it, in, put it under your pillow, and then you think, well, we'll use it someday, but right now I need a new pair of 
japa beads. So, in other words, money, sh everything should be accountable. I think you were telling me that you're making the financial records public. That's important. All financial records should be kept public for everyone to see. So the money's coming in, money's going out, money's spent on this particular item, money's spent on another item. All that should be itemized, accounted, and visible for everyone. <laughs> That's management. Okay. Okay, these are a few things. Any more questions and comments about any etiquette in any any category? Himagori? Yeah. And then uh, after Himagori, then we have um, Govinda Nandana. Um, about taking prasadam, I sure if I understood up till now correctly that um, like let's say Irena is here if somebody takes Irena's remnants then like Irena uh, like it is the saying that karma of for example if Irena is going to them and also that no, the karma no Adam doesn't have any karma yeah yeah please clarify yeah Pushadam doesn't have any karma. <laughs> yeah, just like sometimes devotees would serve the guests at a Sunday feast, and then the guests wouldn't finish, so it would be leftover prashadam. So the question came up, should, can we eat that prashadam because it's left over by the guest? Yeah, because it's prashadam. If it was, if it wasn't, per, if it wasn't prashadam, then it would be contaminated. But because it's prashadam, it cannot be contaminated. Because the prashadam remains what it is, no matter who touches it. But if we take prashadam after. Uh, great person, then it's Maha Maha Prashad, then we get benefit. Is it not opposite? If we can take some Prashad from some person who is not clear in Krishna consciousness, then... It only works one way. <laughs> because they add their spiritual purity to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's only about adding, not subtracting. Sometimes devotees say that in order to be authority for something, you need to behave properly first. Otherwise, you can't be authority. So, some, I'm, I'm not quite sure about this. Should I ask policeman, if you are behaving properly, then I will give you my ID. If you are not behaving properly, then I will not give you my ID. Because he is authority, in some, no matter if he is not behaving properly sometimes, that I don't know. Well, if you have a con continuous misbehavior, then he's not an authority. Sometimes an authority will make a mistake, but that's that doesn't take away from their position as being an authority. But when you see something, you see a, a something a, a flaw that is continuously happening, then you understand that has to be corrected, or you know, generally corrected, not removed, but corrected. Yeah, if you're going to lead, you have to lead by example. You can't lead simply by words. Do what I say, but don't do what I do. That's not leadership. Yeah, good point. Rikindeya? Mm -hmm. Bhagwat, you have one too? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask something practical about um, is it okay to 
for devotees who want to save uh, Lakshmi for Krishna and not give it to others who are not Krishna conscious, if they sometimes, uh, if they have an option between buying, buying something and paying tax or buying something and not paying tax in order to save that money for Krishna, is that acceptable? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand the question. Maybe because I never had this example before. <laughs> Can you clarify a little bit? Well, we could, uh, for example, we could get our car fixed and say to the mechanic that, ask him not to issue an invoice, a bill. Therefore, he doesn't calculate the tax 25% on the price, so we, we pay, we end up paying less. So naturally we want to use this opportunity to serve Krishna by not giving more money to them, but saving that 25% and using it for other things. But on the other hand, it's illegal to uh, not pay tax, so is it... <laughs> Well, it's illegal to have tax, so anyway. <laughs> so the illegality starts from the top. <laughs> tax, as Kali Yuga goes on, there's more and more tax <laughs> just to get your money, that's all. So uh, I think generally we shouldn't be planning like that, but if the opportunity happens, then fine. It's not that you make plans to avoid taxing. <laughs> it's just that if, it, if the opportunity comes up, then and you can save some money for Krishna, then that's fine. I mean, 1914 was the income tax law in the United States. But that was placed during the war because they needed money for war, war funds. But the, 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 uh, after the war, the tax was supposed to be dropped, but they didn't. <laughs> so even today, they have income tax. And so there's a lot of people I know in the United States who don't pay income tax because they say the law is illegal. And it is. But they make it legal. And you can be prosecuted for income tax of evasion. So this whole idea of tax is just one way to get money. That's all. I was at the airport one day, and I had was checking in. This was in Europe somewhere, and I was flying from one place to another. So I was overweight. So the lady said, "Well, you're going to have to pay 29 euros for um, for the overweight." I said, "Fine," and she said, "Oh, but you have to go to the to this window, lady. Is down there's a little window down down the hall there. She showed me where it was, and you go and you bring your money and you pay there. So I went, and I put my 29 euros on the table, and the lady said that that'll be 34 euros. I said it's 29. She said she said yes, but we charge five euros to process it. So I said, I don't really want your processing. <laughs> I'm just paying because I have to. <laughs> uh, I told her that. I said, I don't really want your processing. <laughs> but I couldn't get around it. But I, I, you know, they come up with, the Bhagavatam says that as society goes on, there will be more and more taxes. So much so that people will, practically their whole income will turn into taxes like that. The governments are corrupt and they're starting to fall apart. And so they misuse money or spend money in the wrong way. 
So they'll be trying to get more and more money from the citizens. So you'll see this tax, that tax, this tax, that tax. They have, they have what they call uh, pollution tax in London. If you drive your car in London at a certain time, you get taxed. <laughs> There's taxes for everything. I don't know how, how your country works. It's not so economically developed as many other countries, but the more economic development, the more taxes. <laughs> yeah, but here they don't tax it, they just steal it. <laughs> It's a little, I heard, somehow devotees inform me about the local governments here. They're not so much, what we say, uh, attuned to the people's needs. <laughs> well, that's everywhere, but they cheat in different ways. That's Kali Yuga. That's just the way Kali Yuga is. People are just, they get their positions in order to get money from their followers. Okay, so it's a few minutes to seven and RT is about to begin. So I hope this was helpful. We covered only a small portion of some of the categories with etiquette, but it would be nice to remember some of these points and uh, try to adopt them in different ways. Okay, thank you. Uh, the kirtan's coming up, and I was I would request someone else to lead the kirtan instead of me tonight. I will be happy to participate, but if you can find a kirtan leader, that would be good. Okay, thank you very much, Srila Prabhupada. Keep, Vaishnavaraket, keep.